Well, thank you, everyone, for coming back for more. Um, I, given that this is a breakout, I was uh, hoping we might be able to do it slightly more friendly style, and you could all gather at the front, and I'd stand down there. But I've been told by the tech guys that the cameras are all focused here, and I'm not allowed to leave this space. So, um, um, so apologies for that. So I'm afraid it'll be, it'll be slightly more uh, lecture-ish than, uh, than perhaps a breakout might normally feel. But I will. My, my plan basically is to do, um, is to do two sort of two halves with, 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 with space for questions uh, in each. So um, that's what we'll do. But let's pray and commit this session to the Lord. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we praise you for the wisdom that you have revealed in Christ. And we thank you for having been so kind and merciful as to bring us from darkness to light, from foolishness to wisdom, uh, from idols to worship the true and living God. We do pray, Father, that we would understand our age in which you have placed us and to whom you have sent us as heralds of the gospel. And so we pray that you would equip us to do so, uh, to be heralds faithfully, Give us understanding of our world, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. So I've been asked to speak about the, the preacher and pride. I'm not going to speak about pride in general as a, as a sin, although that certainly is, uh, this certainly is an instance of that. I'm going to be speaking about um, uh, particularly how we understand and relate to the, uh, the LGBTQ plus movement um, as it has become so dominant around us. Let me start with two quotes about who we are, our identity, if you like. Here's the first. Nobody should be subjected to that kind of assault on their identity. Being gay, lesbian, bisexual, or trans is not a sickness. It is a fundamental part of an individual's very identity. Those words were spoken by a uh, British member of parliament named Charlotte Nichols um, just over two years ago in Westminster Hall, um, which is part of the Palace of Westminster. It wasn't actually in a sitting of the House of Commons, um, but it was in the same place. Here is another quote on our identity. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. From Psalm 95, I'm sure many of you recognize it. Now, that the concept of identity, and particularly sexual and gender identity, uh, is really a, a completely new one. While it has attained effectively universal approval and acceptance in our world, um, no one thought like this until very recently. Sexual immorality has existed in every age, of course. But no one uh, believed that your sexual desires defined who you are until really just the last few decades. I think really before uh, the 1970s, perhaps just at the end of the 1960s, the idea starts to appear but this belief that it is, to quote Charlotte Nichols, MP, a fundamental part of an individual's very identity has become universally accepted, it seems, and has caused apparently endless problems to the church and, I think, to preachers and pastors as a result because it leads us to questions like this. Have we, as a church, been cruel to this group of people? Are we asking something of gay people that we are not asking of others? 
for a level of sacrifice or difficulty? Are we guilty of condemning people for who they are rather than accepting them as who they are? Has Christianity been found to be terribly lacking in that for 2,000 years it has not recognized the existence and rights of the LGBTQ plus people in its midst? Many would say so. Is the welcome which Christ offers fatally compromised by the fact that here is one group, or more accurately, a number of groups, but a, a subsection of society who are in fact not welcome? Again, many would say so. Now, the reason I raise these questions is to say we won't deal with this issue. We will not understand this issue properly as long as we buy into the belief that the identities described by the acronym LGBTQ+, and all the other letters, are real identities. That this true is who people truly are. Now, what I want to show us is that, that this is not a new discovery, actually. It's not a terrifying new enemy for the church. It's not fundamentally, actually, a new phenomenon. Rather, what we're dealing with is simply a new religion with a new idol. But in other ways, in every other way, it is the same as how sin has worked itself out in every age of the world. Let me then uh, th uh, speak a little about who we are and who we think we are. Who are we? As uh, I hope you were expecting we would do, we've got to go to the first few chapters of Genesis, where we are, of course, taught that we are the image of God. Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over fish of the sea, birds of the heavens, every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, the, the image of God, therefore, is, is that the most foundational category for understanding what it is to be human. There's a huge amount that could and needs to be said about it, which I can't cover today. Um, but, but let's go for the most essential things about an image. Um, uh, of course, um, we have mirrors and things and think of images in that sense. They didn't really have mirrors, not very good ones anyway in the ancient world. The, an image would particularly have drawn people's attention to a, a statue. And of course, a, a very normal thing in the ancient world would be a king would make an image of himself. Now, what is the function of an image of a king? Well, it, its function is to display the glory of the king downwards to his people. And that is indeed one of the key functions um, of, uh, of us as the images of God. We are made to display God's glory downwards to creation, if you like, and I suppose sideways to one another. That as people see us and as the lower creatures see us, they should see God's glory displayed to them. But also... And in fact, primarily, the purpose of an image is to project glory upwards. Kings made images of themselves in order to glorify themselves. So that as the people looked at the image, uh, their, uh, their admiration of and respect for, and we might even say in some sense worship of, the king himself would be increased and heightened. It is intended to display glory or project glory upwards. And I think that is, uh, as, the way that, as, as the way that Scripture conceives mankind, is really the, the most important thing about the image of God. That, that we are designed to be those who project glory upwards to God, 
That is, to put it in more familiar terms, to be worshippers of God. The Ten Commandments, I think, is where this is most clear. The Ten Commandments is, if you like, an exposition of what the image of God is supposed to look like. And where does it start? It starts with the worship of God. The first four commandments about uh, who you worship, how you worship, in what way you worship, and when you worship. But the Ten Commandments also ends with a command about worship in the, uh, in the, the coveting command. Because to covet is to substitute another thing in the place of God. We are to be worshippers of God. And that is the idea which is Im- uh, embedded in Psalm 95, which I read at the beginning. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. It is when we are on our knees before God, it is when we are declaring his praises and listening to his word and do- doing all the things that we do when we gather to worship God, that is when we are being most truly human. That is when we know who we really are. Because that is what we are made for. That is when we're doing the thing that this is made to do. I, I think only once in my life have driven a proper sports car. We hired a Morgan plus four for my father for one day to celebrate his 80th birthday. Um, it has been his dream to, hire it, to, to drive such a car. And uh, so we hired it for the day. And uh, to my very great delight, he said after a while, I'm a bit tired, Matthew. Would you like to drive it for a bit? Um, so, uh, so I um, got into the car. And what a joy to sit behind an immense engine that's more than half the length of the car and shove your foot to the floor and just feel it roar into life because this is what this machine was made to do. And that's what it's for. And when you're a human being, which we are, it is the worship of God that we are made to do. It is the equivalent of your Morgan plus four having, its foot, having the pedal pushed to the floor, the gas, as you say here, the gas flat to the floor. Right? That, that is what we're for, to worship God. Okay? Uh, that, that is who we are. We are defined by the one whom we are made to worship. You are who you are made to worship. However, that is not who we think we are. It is not who we think we are. Genesis 3, the fall, recounts the first sin. And it is important to see that In the the words of the serpent to tempt the woman to sin, what he does is to describe for her a new reality. Genesis 3 verse 3. Sorry, Genesis 3 verse 4. My apologies. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Even though God has said that she would, that they would. You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. The serpent is drawing the woman to to reconceive of reality and to reconceive of herself as being something other than an image of God. So rather than that she exists in order to bring glory to and and worship to uh, the, 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 the God whose image she is, for that's what it means to be an image, rather the, the serpent persuades her to reconceive of herself as being one who can be God, who can be like God, who can know good and evil for herself. And sin tells lies about who we are. Now, the way in which it does that, I think this, I think, is uh, spelt out with, with great, great clarity and power uh, in the scriptures. Probably the, the, the clearest uh, place where it's dealt with is, is Romans chapter 1. So Romans chapter 1, uh, where Paul is really meditating on or expounding what happened uh, in the Garden of Eden and the way that that has embraced all of mankind. So verse 21, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. 
but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. I hope you can see the, um, the, the echoes of Genesis 3 in those verses. But here's a really interesting thing, is that in the very next verse, Paul goes on without breaking a step to say, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. You see that the, the redefining of ourselves goes hand in hand with the creation of idols. Refusing to be images of God means that we make images and we make gods who are images of ourselves. This is always what sin does. And that the, the way in which it works out is, is that it, we, we, we desire to do what is wrong. That is the corruption of our nature inherited from Adam. But we want to define right and wrong differently to how God has defined them. We want to declare evil to be good and good to be evil. And it, in order to do that... We, we're never satisfied with simply declaring so on our own authority. Rather, we want to find a peg higher than our own heads to hang it on, which means that we need to create a God. A God who will conveniently declare what we want to be good to be good, what we want to be evil to be evil. And so, therefore, the move which says, I desire to do what God has forbidden leads very directly to saying, so I will create a new God who will grant me permission to do so. It's one of the shocks I think the church has discovered in really only the last decade that whereas people thought of us as being weird and backwards, now they think of us as being evil and declare Christian virtues to be a new form of sin. And things that Christians have always understood to be sins are now declared to be virtues, particularly in the sexual realm. But that is what idols are for. It is to redefine good and evil for us. But here is the, the thing which always happens with idolatry, is that we make idols to be tame gods who will conveniently define good and evil as we want them to, but then we worship them. We, fight, we think that idols are our route to freedom, but then they enslave us because we are worshipping people. So when we create gods, we start to believe that they really are gods. Isaiah chapter 44 is the, the classic um, satire on this, where he describes a man who, who cuts down a tree and half of it he makes into firewood to heat his home and cook his food. And the other half he carves into a god, nails it in place and then falls down and worships it and says, you are my god. And, and that is the stupidity of idolatry. We create gods and then we think that they are gods. But here is the final piece that we've got to see, Psalm 115, verse 4 to 8 says, that those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. Our idols come to define us. Very clearly in Acts 19, where um, uh, when there is the riot in Ephesus, why are the Ephesians outraged? Because the gospel is... Uh, is diminishing the status of Artemis. And what do they shout for two hours in the theatre? Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Their goddess grounds their sense of who they are. They name themselves by their idols. And that is what people have done in every age of the world. Everyone conceives themselves to be, before anything else, the people of their gods. That's what the word Muslim means, isn't it? It means a submitter to Allah. If you believe that Allah is God, then he will define you. What has this got to do with LGBTQ plus identities, with the whole pride movement which is so 
prevalent. What it means is this. What we have here is not a new phenomenon, not a new discovery, that there's something about humanity we've all missed. No, it's just a new idol. For in the West, ever since the Enlightenment, the thing that we have come to worship is the free, autonomous self. And in our world, that is the great God whom, we, uh, whom our nation worships. Now, we do it under various guises, but in one way or another, the autonomous self, the free self, is the thing which we think must be served. Our laws have been rewritten, both in your country and in mine, progressively over the last uh, 30, 40 years, to place the, the autonomous self as the non-negotiable value which all things must respect. And as every individual, we have been taught that it is yourself that matters most. It is yourself that you should serve. It is yourself that defines you. And if you think that, then you will think that you are defined by the feelings of yourself, what you find in yourself. And that is what the identities of the pride movement are straightforwardly doing. What do the letters stand for? Lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, questioning, all the others that follow on with the possible exception, I think, of intersex. It doesn't really quite fit. But, um, but what, what they are is they are labels of identity derived from what is found in the self. That is no different to what idolatry has done in every era. I think it is also true that this is actually much wider than the LGBT movement. In fact, it is across society. The, the very fact that we've come to speak of, our, of, uh, of individuals as being heterosexual, actually, I think, is a symptom of the same thing. We, we are not our lusts of whatever form they take. We are images of God designed to love him with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. But in a world that worships the self, whatever lusts are found there, we take to define ourselves. Now, for preachers, pastors and ministers, this is extremely important for how we, uh, how we preach in this context. It's important because, well, firstly, there is no need to panic. I think that has been the response of the church in very large measure is to think that this thing that we've suddenly encountered is like nothing we've ever experienced before. And here's a whole new set of issues and problems that we've just never thought about before. And I can go back and read in the church fathers and they don't talk about gay people. And I can read the Puritans and there's no discussion of trans people. And, and here's, a, here's a whole new issue which we've just not dealt with before. But brothers and sisters, be comforted. It's not new. Everywhere that the church has gone to preach the gospel, she has had to confront the idols of the day and has had to confront the fact that the people who worship those idols believe that those idols are truly God and therefore truly define them. It is fundamentally no different from going to be a missionary in, say, 19th century India and discovering that people believe themselves defined by the caste system as is uh, as it's set out in and believed in the, whole, in, the, in the whole Hindu way of understanding the world and reincarnation and the different deities and, uh, and the way that karma works and all those things, as I 
mentioned earlier on. And, uh, and people believe themselves to be defined by these things. And what do you do as a Christian when you come into, as a missionary into that context? You come and you proclaim Christ crucified and proclaim that he, he sets us free from being defined in those ways. You are not whatever the different castes are. That isn't what you are. It doesn't describe you. Or if you go to a Muslim country, you, you are not a creation of Allah. Or missionaries who went to Africa in the 19th century and more recently dealing with animism of various sorts. You, you are not controlled by and defined by the spirits of your ancestors. You see? And all we are saying in our age is just the same thing. Yes, you have been taught that yourself is divine, that yourself is the ultimate value, and therefore that you are defined by what you find there, but, but you, you're not. Therefore, we should not lose confidence. We should be very confident. The gospel is about a new identity in Christ. Ephesians 4, Paul talks about how you were taught in Christ to put off the old self and to put on the new self. Or as Christ says in, uh, in uh, Mark chapter 8, and in the other Gospels too, but I think Mark 8 is uh, particularly clear, when he's called, sorry, when he, he asks his disciples who he is, and Peter identifies him for the first time, and uh, Peter then says he, he mustn't go and suffer and die, and Jesus rebukes him, and, and then calls the crowd to him. Mark 8, 34, he called the crowd to him with his disciples and said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Deny himself. All idols are kind of a packaging up of the self in, some way, in one way or another. All we're experiencing in our day is, if you like idolatry in its, most, in its purest form, it's an idolatry that's cut out the middleman, Rather than project myself onto some carved piece of wood and then worship that, I'll just worship myself directly. But the gospel of Christ says, yeah, that, that version of you has got to die. You've got to lose your life. But if you do, you will save it. Deny yourself. Stop believing that you are defined by yourself. Stop thinking that yourself must be satisfied like every idol demands to be satisfied. And you will find that that isn't death, but the gateway to life. It's the same gospel. I do think, however, it has some pretty big implications for our preaching. This issue is not primarily, in our day, about sexual morality. I don't think I can emphasize that too strongly. I'm not saying that we should not preach about sexual morality. Of course we should. It's always a key pastoral and preaching concern in the church. And yet, if we think that what we're dealing with here is, a, is something that is limited to the level of being moral or not, we have not grasped and understood what is going on. The issue here is idolatry. And that, that has always been true. You, you could, a good parallel would be um, the, the worship of Astarte or Artemis, two, two um, names really for the same goddess, in the ancient world was frequently by temporal prostitution. And if you wanted to uh, plead for the goddess's uh, uh, blessing of fertility, the way in which you did so was to visit one of the prostitute shrines and couple with a prostitute as part of your worship. Now, that is a horrific immorality, quite apart from, of course, a horrific abuse of the women involved. But it is intriguing to see that the apostles did not preach simply against that. But rather, you need to preach, and they preached against the worship of the goddess herself. Until the goddess is dethroned, there will be no possibility of people hearing the moral appeal. 
And this, I think, is where we are. The, the church in general has, um, the, the, the Orthodox church, um, in contrast to those bits of the church which have just been willing to sell out to falsehood uh, and idolatry, the Orthodox church has tended to respond with a real desire to be faithful. And so, therefore, we, we just keep on saying again and again, but, you know, homosexuality is an abomination. It says so in Leviticus. Or as Paul says, this is, a, this is such were some of you, and those who live like this cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Those are true. They're all true and right. But, but as long as people believe this is what I am, then that will not carry any weight. But the gospel message is this is not what you are. What you are is a creature of the triune God who has come to call you back to himself in Jesus Christ. And yourself is not a God whom you need to serve. We, uh, a few years ago, put on a, um, uh, an evening sort of lecture, but sort of discussion thing, which was intended to be for mainly for our undergraduate students in York. Quite a few come to our church. And we, we told them to go and invite their friends to come to this. So it was a, a sort of outreach evangelistic event. Um, and it was just as the trans thing was get, just beginning to get off the ground. And um, so we made it about that. And we said, you know, well, uh, you know, who am I? You know, what is our identity? I think the title was something like that. So I spoke similar lines to what I've been saying. I addressed it slightly differently because it was rather a different audience. But, um, and I spoke for about 20 minutes. And then I said, right, anyone got any questions? And a hand shot up. And it was a, a young woman in the front row very calm and friendly, but just said, um, she just said, well, the first thing I want to say is I'm bisexual. So what's the, what are you saying about me? And what does all this mean for me? And I was very pleased she asked the question. Um, and my response to her was to say, um, the first thing you must know is that as Christians, we, we won't think of you like that. That you think that you are bisexual, what I want to say to you is that you are an image of the infinitely glorious eternal God. And you are designed to display his glories to the world and to live forever worshipping him. That's what, you're, that's what you are. Um, and you don't need to define yourself by something actually as, as trivial and as also slightly unpleasant as the kind of sexual things you're talking about. We think of you far too highly to define you that way. And, um, well, she was very struck. She came to speak to me afterwards, wanted to hear more. Um, she even came to church for a number of times, and then I haven't seen her since. I have no idea what's happened to her. Um, so I can't claim it as a massive evangelistic triumph. <laughs> but I think it did illustrate for me that we, we have something to say to people which is not just something they need to hear, it is exactly what they need to hear. And particularly the young people of today are in pieces, in anxiety about who they are. The trans movement is, is really a... a a demonstration of that, this, uh, th this kind of sense of being just all at sea. I don't know what I am. And the more I look inside myself to try and see what I am, the more I find something that shifts and changes and I can't pin it down and I don't know how to speak about it. And, and the, 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 the desire of so many young people to do such awful things to themselves, I think, is an expression in, to a substantial degree of, uh, of a deep, deep desire to know something solid about who I am. Perhaps if I do this, I'll feel comfortable with myself. And in that context, to be able to preach to people the glory of what we're created to be and who God has redeemed us in Christ to be is a wonderful, wonderful gospel to be able to bring. Look, I've used most of my time. So I think what I'm going to do is to... Um, uh, to stop there and basically throw it open for questions. This is supposed to be an interactive seminar, despite me standing up here. So um, let me um, invite you to ask questions and 
we'll go to for the rest of the time in, in answering those. So who would like to go first? I can't really see. Oh, well done. Thank you. The lights are too bright. I can't see very well. So be bold. Yes, go ahead, sir. So um, I assume the sound guys would like me to repeat the question, so I'll, uh, I'll do that. Um, the question is, how, how do we... Uh, I've spoken about speaking within our churches and within my church. How can we try and get the message out more widely? Um, so two things to say. Um, I think it is, it is always and has always been the case that the primary mode by which Christ grows his church is... Uh, is actually through the assembly of the saints and the worship of God's people on the Lord's day, um, which may sound, and certainly in the, in the light of lots of kind of teaching about church growth and outreach and a lot of the models that, that's been, that have been used for the, the last few decades may sound a bit alien, but actually I, I genuinely think that's true. I mean, you can see it in the Old Testament that uh, it is the glory of the temple that draws the nations to come. Um, and, uh, and in the New Testament, as Paul speaks about, you know, unbelievers coming into the assembly and saying, God is really among you. And um, so while there is absolutely a place, and I'll come to that in a minute, for deliberately speaking outside the church, I always say to our church, by far the best thing you can do to spread the gospel is to invite your neighbors, friends, and family to come to church with you. Um, and I want to really encourage us all to do that, and therefore to preach in a way that expects that there are unbelievers present. Um, and I, I very consciously do that. I do that even when I know every face in the room <laughs> and I know that they're all at least confessing Christ. Um, and that's partly because even when we know all the faces, we don't know what's going on in their hearts. But also because I know if I preached like that, they're more likely to invite someone to come next week. Um, so, so that's part of the answer, I think, is to... Is to, is to make sure that in, the, in our preaching to the Lord's people... Um, we are preaching clearly and faithfully on this. Um, not least because amongst the saints who are sitting in front of us uh, every Sunday, there are, there, are, there are people who are dealing with temptations of the heart which, of which they are deeply ashamed. And in our day and age, there will always be people who have this kind of question in their mind, maybe I'm gay maybe I'm trans, because they're being presented with that all the time. And we need to be giving comfort to the Lord's people all the time. That This is not what you are. It is absolutely normal to have to, to, have to wrestle with our sinful nature. Um, if I had more time, I'd go into that. Um, there's plenty about that in Scripture. Um, but it doesn't mean this is who you are, who you are is in Christ. That's, that's the biggest part of the answer. The second part is... It, in terms of how we deliberately proclaim things to the world outside as much as we can, I think it depends on your context. Um, you know, if we'd been doing this 200 years ago, going and standing in the town square and speaking on a soapbox was actually quite an effective way of doing it. I don't think it is now. Um, uh, so I do think that, that we can we putting on special events in our church, like the one I mentioned, I think is a thing that can work well. There will be occasions when it's possible to speak. Uh, in other environments, uh, recently I was invited to go and speak at a debate at the University of New York about whether the church needs to move with the times or not. Um, I couldn't do it, but I got one of my trainees to do it. He's doing it in a couple of weeks. Um, you can pray for him. He's called Ed Rowett. And I hope pray for him to be a good, uh, a good opportunity. Um, and also there are opportunities to write things. And I think um, uh, if you, if you, many of us might have local newspapers or even just online things, which where we can we can gently but clearly try and set these things out. I think we should do those things. Um, but in right now, where we are in history, it seems to me the main thing we've got to focus on is to to keep the church faithful. And all through the early days of the church, when the Roman Empire was so terribly hostile, being a faithful church for 300 years is what brought the empire to its knees. And if we're faithful for the next 300 years. That this will pass. There'll be something else that'll come in its place. But yeah, thank you. That was a good, good question. 
Uh, okay, uh, yes, back there. Oh, we've got a microphone. Exciting. There we go. So, so I know in the UK there's been movement with uh, medical practices who are no longer doing uh, transition surgery for minors. Your prime minister just had came out and said, you know, a man is a man, a woman is a woman. So mm -hmm. it seems like there's some cultural shifts going on in the UK. And I'm wondering, as a pastor, how do you help your church navigate what it means to truly be a gospel witness and not just go along with a political conservative movement that mm -hmm. might be a kind of pendulum swing and not actually be at the heart of the gospel? Yeah, that's a super question. And we... Um and that's a major deal. In fact, in some ways, I think that's a bigger deal for you in America than it is for us. Um, it, even our politicians who, who yeah, you mentioned our prime minister, did say that. On the other hand, um, <laughs> he's also regularly threatening to criminalize us if we say the opposite. In fact, this is, this is how bizarre it is in Britain, is that, um, that the, uh, our current government uh, published some proposed legislation two years ago, and if that had become law, what the Prime Minister said, those of you who saw this reported two weeks ago, would have been illegal under its own law, <laughs> which was, was pretty extraordinary. Um, uh, it's a lot of politicking there. Uh, I think the answer to that, uh, it, it, the answer to the whole question of can we, how do we deal with the fact that there are things on both, there are movements that are opposed to transgenderism. I think we want to say, well, praise the Lord, it's always a good thing when evil, evil is restrained in one way or another. And um, to the extent that, yes, I think in Britain we are seeing a, a something of a stepping back from the, uh, from the worst of the transgender movement. Um, well, I praise the Lord for that. However, I'd want to say two things. Firstly, um, don't be too confident. Uh, I think it's much less... Uh, I think it's going to be much less of a stepping back than we think. And this movement is so powerful, and it is powerful precisely because it is an idolatrous religion. Um, it's not going to go away because religions don't just go away. Right? It, it is a whole new religion, this, and it's, and it's profoundly held... Um, so don't be too excited when you think that, oh, good, maybe we're going to get away from this and maybe people will turn against it. Um, uh, but the other thing to say is that, yeah, by God's common grace, secular people are able to sometimes perceive some real evils as being evil. However, there will be very... When... when uh, when ungodly, unchristian people react against one evil, they usually replace it with another. Um, and I think you can see that happening again and again uh, in, in history. <laughs> and I think we are going to see that unfolding in lots of ways. Um, and so uh, it, it's a little bit strange when Christians get very enthusiastic when they see atheistic feminists being very anti-transgender. And you can say, yeah, we're, we're on board, we're on the same page. Well, praise the Lord for being able to be co-belligerent, but we're not on the same page. Um, and uh, if the, the only answer to, 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 to this whole movement is, is not just to wind back the clock by 15 years and think we can, we can just undo the transgenderism and just let, we'll settle for all of the, all of the gay rights stuff, but we just want to take come back. That, that will not work. Um, and it won't work because the, the two things spring from the same root, which is the idolatry of the self. And we're going to see this go further. You know, it, if we think this is horrific, there are things coming up that are more horrific. Um, and the only answer is to say, it's, it's about who we worship. It's about God. I'm being told to stop so I'm going to stop. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, if you want, there's, there's plenty more in my book, so uh, do go and buy that if you would like to look into this more.